Welcome back to Joshua Loves to Draw, episode 13. We are working today with our model. Today I'm going to focus on quick gestural drawing, knock it back, and then focus on working on a specific area, which is called a fragment in art. So I'll be doing that, and uh, yeah, let's see how it goes. Let's get started. Head up red. Yeah. And if you ever notice that's not red, let me know, because that means it's not recording. Okay, so we've got a, a one leg up pose. Gonna start low and just, so in this case, I'm sort of just deciding how big I want the drawing to be. I'm not doing anything but that. I'm just thinking that it's, it's pretty upright, it's pretty tall. And so what I can do now is I can sort of estimate the, uh, the pos position of the pubic symphysis, which should be my halfway point, which in reality, it's going to uh, vary from model to model. So, from here to here, I'm going to pick a halfway point, which to me looks like it's about here. And in this case, I'm going to make the pubic symphysis just a little bit below that for a slightly uh, longer torso look. And because it's so upright, for no particular reason except for I just, these are the first rhythms that are drawing my attention. I'm just sort of feeling... The fact that it actually is not quite perfectly upright, we do have sort of a we do have sort of a stepping back here, and we do have a lifted shoulder, and we do have maybe here, and we do have a the head is sort of and doing a downward glance, and it's sort of leaning forward. And I'm just aware that that's the kind of thing that if there's something that's going to move in the pose, it's most likely going to be that. So anticipating, you know, what is going to maybe move as the pose settles, that is actually uh, useful to do because you can decide in your lay-in to be a little more ambiguous with some areas of the drawing because you, you anticipate that not staying still perfectly based on gravity, based on your experience with what you know, typically uh, what, what models can hold and what tends, to, what tends to change. So you can do that. So ambiguity is actually a good thing in that respect in that you can tie something down later. That's what the animators call it. They call it tying it down. You can tie something down later. Okay, so I've got sort of a semi-reclining, semi-standing kind of a pose. I'm going to start it nice and low here. And I'm just going to start with the rhythms rather than uh, figuring out my half point in this case because in this particular pose, those rhythms are more important to me than anything else. And so that can tend to be one of the ways that you decide what to draw first or what your process is because students are often... Or other artists even will ask, 
what's the best way to start? Do we start with shape? Do you start with these sort of flows? Do you start with like a stick figure, like an action line kind of a thing? And I think the answer to that has a lot to do with what your priorities are. It also depends on what this pose is. And so in this pose, this sort of lifting to here, coming up vertically, turning. So there's an inflection coming up this way, and then the neck, and then the head up here. This is sort of what is more important to me. So that being the case, I can, uh, I can draw that first, and then I can... Then I can check the measurements, right? Then I can see. All right, so this total height here, I'm estimating where the pubic symphysis is, dropping it. That is actually working out to be around halfway in this case. So in other words, from here to here, and this is halfway. So I probably need to lower the, the lower torso a bit. All right, so it looks like I need to drop this down a little more. I need to feel this moving up. This arm is accentuating that that movement across the back. And so that's actually quite an important part of this pose. And this is actually sort of, if I continue the angle of the head, we're gonna cross the breast, and then we are going to hit the thigh. And I think the, the thigh is definitely foreshortening from this angle, so I need to make sure that it looks like it's going back into that picture plane. This is all still laying at this point. I'm just trying to get things in, in, in overall place. Got a, a leaning over pose where the model is dipping down and the arms are hanging. And so really I can sort of start thinking about that almost like half of a half of a regular figure pose. So instead of it being as tall as this, it's going to be about halfway, come back before it starts bending over it. So but I don't need to draw it this small on the page. That's just a way to think about it. So I can basically just enlarge this whole thing. But that's the idea, is that I'm thinking about that. I'm always sort of thinking about what would the total height be if, if, uh, if the model were to stand up. And in a pose like this, I'm thinking of, okay, where are the knees? And I do have measurements from that from here to here to the ASIS. If it was upright, it should be halfway. It's important just to know if I'm in the ballpark. Also, I don't want to make the feet face the same direction. That would be the most obvious mistake to make here. The feet are facing different directions. This is going this way, and this is going that way. That's natural, although the feet can be made to face the same way, but generally speaking, they face it outwards. And then getting up and around here. And then I'm going to use these measurements now of the feet and the knee and these other areas, and I'm going to relate those horizontally to where the elbow is, for example, so, and where that shoulder is, for example. So that shoulder appears to be like, here, which is basically where I had it. You're always looking for, in limbs, you're always looking for, and the arms are hanging. But you're looking for this sort of longer C curve that crosses one side of the arm, and that's really important. And then, you, so you almost always, with the arm, want to find that versus the, the side that has more, 
more curves and rhythms. And you'll notice that from many angles that that sort of a pattern appears. And so now because I have the shoulder, I might as well uh, move over to the neck. And I want to get a sense of where, of where the head is. So I can see there's a lot of, we got a lot of hair, but I can see the ear. And um, I can see that the chin is high. So I just want to get some kind of placement there. Thank you. And then now this whole story on this side is obviously going to be the dropping, dropping, dropping. Just taking a minute to... tag any uh, obvious landmarks that are going to help me but I need to remember that the rib cage is higher in the back and so this is going to be C7 and the rib cage despite what Bridgman tells us and despite what a lot of people on the internet say the rib cage is flexible so if it's bending over yes indeed the rib cage bends it is not solid it can be helpful to think of it as a solid but the anatomical reality is that the rib cage is flexible. It's flexible because there's two joints that articulate with the spine, and then there's a joint that articulates with the costal cartilages, and those are springy and those are flexible. They're much more dynamic and they're much more complex and they're much more individualistic than we uh, than we think. We tend to oversimplify them and and. And then problems will emerge when you do that, but uh, they can be very subtle because usually you're looking at the surface stuff. You're not looking at those underlying forms. The pelvis is high, and I want to get some sense of where that's positioned it. And then I've got my rector muscles, which are exposed, and then we've got this sort of drop. And I don't feel like I, I don't quite feel it enough yet, but another thing to take note of is just the effects of gravity on hair, on, the, on every part of the body. The body's constantly being affected by gravity, but if you don't think to look for it, you won't see it. So that's a good habit to always think about these sort of physical forces, sort of like how Mike Matessi talks about it in his force course on New Masters Academy. And also in Mike's books and in his own training, it's, a, it's the same idea. But you're looking for these, these rhythms and these uh, details to accentuate that give you the, the sense of the, of the movement of the pose. Leaning on a seat. And so we've got these nice uh, rhythms of the, of the leg that's making contact with the ground, but it's also uh, all of this is foreshortening, so the foot. If you find that uh, you want to put the foot closer, you're getting close to the edge, and you're in this stage, well, then just simply raise the knee. You don't have to, you don't have to crop it. Okay, so I'm, I want to think about starting to get a little more familiar with uh, the shapes from, from this model because we worked with, worked with our a couple weeks ago, so some of these are starting to become more familiar, which is helpful. So this is subtle. It's almost like a profile that is slightly vanishing, where it's just slightly foreshortening as we move up. I want to leave sort of a note for myself, and which means probably, and I, I can see that this is indeed the case, that the pelvis is higher on this side as well. I'm sort of thinking about the position of the feet relative to each other. I'm seeing the lower part of this foot. I'm seeing this knee, which is further. All of this is further from us. That's the way I want to approach the, the torso. And we've got the ribcage kind of moving back in a nice dramatic 
nice dramatic way. So I'm going to stop for a minute and sort of take out, take in everything. The other way I'm going to be able to tell this complex movement of the rib cage is just the fact that we can only see one breast from this angle. So that tells me that it's rotated away from me. I could even do a little evidence of the other side and then the pectoralis are lifting up because the arm is lifted and I'm not going to get into the arm in this drawing. This arm. Deltoid, we've got scapula. Making our way down and then we've got the other. So anytime you can show either with the shoulders or the buttocks or the thoracic arch, if you can show both sides of the torso and you can show that one side's above the other, that, that's a way to show orientation. So you have to think about that. You can't just draw both sides across the center line without thinking, okay, which side's higher or which side is. And also what's really cool about this pose actually, we're seeing her head from below. And I really, I really like that kind of situation. I'm going to do a very light People get thrown off by for short imposes One of the reasons is because it's harder to judge the proportions when the body is not in this sort of simple, simple frontal position. The knee's going to come as far out as that, and it's going to be making sort of a, it's making an angle like this. And then whereas the outside of the knee here on this side does not come further than that. And so just making a few, just a few even very loose measurements and observations that can help you and where you're still mostly thinking in very free, in a very free way. But you're still, uh, you're not going to be as off as you would if you didn't just drop that plummet line, that vertical line, for example. So we definitely got a little concavity here, and even though I'm not doing it justice, I do want to note it because it's a noticeable thing in this pose. And also, probably the most notable thing is, is how the scapula are pushing up because they're supporting weight, like just like a suspension on a, on a vehicle. That's sort of what the pelvis and the shoulder girdle is for animals. So that's the suspension and it allows for a greater range of motion and in, in humans and other primates, it allows us to uh, swing and climb. Generally speaking, it does have this sort of, I mean, you can see just in some poses, you can see the human scapula becoming more of that structural suspension it just takes the right pose to bring out that to bring out that uh aspect of our uh, anatomy and our evolutionary history so i'm really seeing the bottom of that and it's just such a nice graceful curves with this nice half tones and so i don't want to be brutal
with the pelvis, a lot of times people will ask, you know, well, I can't tell which way the pelvis is facing. From any angle, you can learn a lot about it. You're looking for the sacrum, which is not always obvious, but if you can see that triangular shape, that's helpful. You're looking for the center line of the intergluteal cleft. And then you're also looking for like where that cleft makes a, uh, makes a, a turn. That's going to tell you where the, where the bottom is. Thank you. Okay, so we've got sort of a kneeling pose here. And the, the knees are sort of ending here. Now I'm just going to, going to use a, a, um, just some really simple roundish forms, almost like slapping some clay down for a sketch. And I'm going to really try to ignore all the Obviously, the details that I find interesting at the moment, I'm, I'm trying to ignore those. I'm trying to ignore, I'm even ignoring the difference between the left and the right leg at the moment. I'm just trying to think of simple forms, almost like as if this was like a wax figure and I was just slapping together some warm wax to get some of the volumes. And I'm trying to, as much as possible, in this case, not always, but what I'm talking about now is not allow my eye to dart from one specific area to the other, but try to, try to take it in the whole way. And so I'm noticing this isn't horizontal enough. So I'm moving this back, and I'm looking at the lower part of the torso here, this nice form. These are sort of fitting together, and then now that I've got this simple thing, I can start to modify it. If you go really slowly at the beginning and you try to take in the whole thing, you get a more accurate lay-in, essentially. And that's an advantage because then as you develop the drawing, things just sort of fall into place a little more nicely. Not that that always has to be the priority, or not that that always has to be what you what you are trying to do, but I'm trying to see where this wrist is here. I'm not going to leave this being that swooping, but on this side I actually might, because if the uh, medial epicondyle of the arm does not break the profile, you tend to get these really nice regular curves on the inside. I want to feel where this pit of the neck is. That's why my center line helps. I want to get an idea of where the back of the of the rib cage is and get an idea of where the rib cage itself will be now that I have these simple forms are not the same as actually drawing anatomy. I haven't drawn anatomy yet. I'm drawing simple forms that are informed by anatomy. And then we've got a really nice angle on the neck. And so in this case I'm building from the torso to the neck. We've got a really nice angle. I'm going to use a simple ovoid to describe the head. Peaceful, quiet kind of a feeling to this pose. Right now this looks like a tangent, but I'm going to make the overlap a little more obvious. I'm just going to stop, back up a minute, take it in, and see what is feeling, see what is feeling off, if anything. And I think this needs to drop more because I think we're really seeing more of the 
that's the side of the, that's the lateral aspect of the distal head of the condyles of the femur. And so that's going to tend to box it up. And then I also want to get this corner here across the femur, see that patella, and then see how this stuff is going back in. And so just making these little adjustments here, this is all part of, this will all pay off as the, as the drawing progresses. I mean, that, that's how I handle a lot of uh, correction and accuracy is through approaching the same drawing through different stages using different approaches or different ways of doing the drawing. So maybe I'm going more part to part and then I'm looking for the big curves or maybe I'm just trying to see these simple volumes I'm describing and then maybe I'm hyper-focusing on one area and by... Uh, switching gears and, and thinking of the drawing in a different way. Each time I, I find something that is corrective as well. So by turning my attention to one aspect of the drawing, I'm able to correct it. And just by stacking those layers of approaches one after another, you start to get the best of all worlds. Each of these techniques has a strength, and so you correct the weaknesses of the techniques at one stage at a time, but you still get the, those benefits. So I find that to be the most a rewarding kind of approach, as opposed to more of a formula, which makes sense. And when you're studying, there's nothing wrong with learning a technique or learning a formula. And if you're in you know, Michael Matessi's class, you're going to do it Mike's way. You should definitely do it Mike's way. And if you're in Sheldon Bornstein's class, you're going to do it Sheldon's way. And if you're in Glenn Vilpu's class, you're going to do it Glenn's way. <laughs> So yeah, you, uh, when you're a student, you want to, as much as possible, conform yourself to what the teacher is doing. I'm assuming you're having a professional, an expert, a master, ideally, as your teacher. That's sort of, I'm speaking from, this doesn't apply if your, te if your teachers can't draw. I don't, people are watching this from all over the world. So within the context of having a competent uh, instructors, it's really important for you to do it their way in the class. It's really up to you to customize it and do it your own way once you have those skills. Before you have those skills, you're not really in a position to be able to do that. And so a lot of times uh, some of the stuff I'm talking about might be more advanced and I don't have time to flag that every time. You can kind of tell it does have sort of a look. When I sneak up on it the way I'm doing now, where it's, I'm really keeping it simple and I'm really trying not to jump ahead too quickly as opposed to just getting in there and finding all of these forms that I, that I like and finding all of these muscular and anatomical rhythms, those kinds of things, and really getting into the parts. I love both. To me, sometimes I think of it like, delayed gratification like I'm going to get these things right so that I can really indulge myself in exploring maybe these rhythms of the arm there's no point in drawing the rhythms of the arm if it's in the wrong if the arm's in the wrong place oh, I love how the hand I just realized that I really love how the hand looks because it's got such a nice gesture to it and it's just really soft and subtle And so just as I was talking about discipline and delaying gratification, I'm now drawing just these little shapes of the hand. So This is really interesting because then what happens is you get from here 
up here, more vertical than I have it, stepping out here, and then making our way over that armpit. And I've got a strong diagonal movement. I'm starting with that. I'm getting a sense of how the lower body is moving in space. I'm not an academic artist. I don't work academically, but at the same time, like ideas like an envelope, these are all just tools, and sometimes that tool can be useful. It depends. But in, so in this case, I want to relate this diagonal to this, and then I want to get a good sense of how much this stepping back is happening. We've got an opening up to the shoulders, and then we've got a shoulder that is high. Interesting head position as well. Again, sort of like a thoughtful kind of a feeling. At least that's the way I'm, I'm interpreting it. All that matters is the what, how I'm interpreting it because I'm the one making the drawing and I can push it, show different emotional context. Word or, or an idea of what the feeling of the pose seems to be to you. You can put that into words, even if it's just in your, in your own mind. That can be helpful. You can use emotional words just like, this pose is about loss. This pose is about sorrow. This, But having some kind of emotional connotation will help you inform your decision so that you're doing more than dealing with the, the form. And so this would look too short unless I can show. And so I'm using sort of an elliptical movement. I'll often carry that movement, but I won't take it across the adductor area. I'll sort of separate it as I move up. So it's just a notation for me. So what that does is it sort of gives me You really need to stop and, and find the patella because oftentimes you think you know where it is and then you look more carefully and you're like, oh no, the, it's doing something different. And so I'll use often use notation that's just for me just to tell me, okay, here's where the patella is or here's where the tibial uh, plateau is and et cetera, et cetera. And so here I want to find a center line and that center line I want to be, I just want to treat that center line like it's just the most important thing I've ever seen in order to do justice to the beauty of, of the figure that I see, I really have to get that center line correct. And when you're working from life and you see something that is legitimately inspiring, you want to add this to your repertoire. You want this to be in your brain so that it can come out when you're working for imagination, or you can literally use it later for, for other purposes. It requires your focus. For example, if you're trying to do like flashy drawings that are impressive to look at and that's your focus, well, then you're probably not going to be as sensitive to what's going on in front of you because you're, you're so concerned with the technique of the drawing. And so you could have really beautiful things going on that you didn't even notice. Like maybe it's the hand because you're just not being present enough. You're kind of doing a thing. Give yourself that freedom to explore and make sure that you are uh, seizing opportunities when they, when they come. And every opportunity to draw, every time you can work with a model, all of these are opportunities. And you can, just like with any other opportunity, you can certainly squander them. Some of what I think has been successful so far is getting this complex 
interweaving of of forms and how these overlaps are happening in the lower body. It's working okay. It's trying to establish where these inner corners are versus the rest of the form. I think all of that is probably working. And then I can do this with a cast shadow, but I don't need the cast shadow as an excuse to show that going back. This sort of strong diagonal and then my navel is here. My external obliques are here. The pelvis below, this flattens out. The tensor, asis, making sure that feels like it's connecting to where sartorius should be. I can accentuate the drooping or the dropping where I want it in the pose, even to the point where I'm changing the body type. I'm not really going to do that this time. I will. I'm known to do that. Just just be open to what nature is really showing you and, and try things and don't worry so much about don't worry so much about that. I need to build these forms up before that'll look convincing. I want to get this out more. I'm going to move that over. And so every time you move something, it, it makes the drawing messier and it makes it look less intentional. You want to learn something, you want to, you want to reach a higher level in your work, pretending or trying to distract from the mistakes or ignore them or avoid them by the choices you're making. I don't think that's the better way. I think you want to like catch every punch with your face. You want to get tough here. You want to know how to fix things. You want to be, you want to get strong. You, nothing phases you. You're not going to easily give up on a drawing. Not that you won't give up for sure, but you want to build that resilience. And a lot of that comes from not avoiding mistakes, not being afraid of making a bad drawing. I really want to make sure that I put the next in the right place. But instead, sort of leaning into that. Jesus, it's completely different. You took you you stepped out of a drawing session to talk about a goat.
I'm going to continue with the approach I was using last time of just forcing myself to start with something that is really simple. Almost like throwing down a bunch of clay. Afterwards, uh, I'm molding it. And anytime you have one part of the body, like the arm, coming and touching the knee, part of the body leaves and then comes back and makes contact, that makes it extra challenging because any, anything in the pose that you change, that distance is closing itself off. Uh, it either requires more accuracy on your part or you just need to be more flexible in how you design these problems because if it's leaving here and it's touching here, well, then this is an arm's length. And no matter what I do here, I have to make sure that that starting and end point there uh, feel correct. When you notice that in a pose, like maybe the models, you know, their hand on their hip, for example, you got to like really make sure that you get the lengths of those parts right. That's a potential issue that you can run into. Center lines can be done extremely carefully. I, I do both. And sometimes I'll also do like a lay-in version of it like that. That that's another way to uh, to do it. You can work up the neck, or what I sometimes do is place the head. And I pretty much always use a sort of a, a round ovoid form, which is the traditional head construction. It goes back to ancient art, and we definitely see it in the Renaissance. And it's something that my mentor and my teacher Glenn Vilpu also uses it big advocate of it. You might have seen me online talking about it, using the egg. Use the egg for the head. I, I'm off. I think it's the, the great way to do head construction because it's ambiguous enough until you want to pin it down. Some of these 20th century illustrator constructions, what I don't like about them is that there's too many steps. The construction is going for like a final construction too quickly and that construction is not that good. So I would rather stick with something very simple and round and malleable like clay and then I can build it out the way I want. But there's, there's many other advantages to starting out with an ovoid besides those. You know, you'll notice if you look at drawings by Michelangelo or Raphael or Bernini or all kinds of the old masters, you're going to find that's precisely how they, how they think of it to begin with. Not that there weren't other constructions that were used. This is sort of a tried and true one. The arm that's supporting the body is squishing up against here, and so this can be an opportunity for me to show you that we can, we can change the pose. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to bring this elbow in more, And then I'm going to change the angle of it here. Brought it in. Why? Because I don't want the hand to be here. I want it to be here. And also, that, that's a way that you can take a pose that is also like difficult to hold and you can make it look even more in movement by adjusting the support. That's a really nice way to, to do it. I'm trying to get a feeling of how I want to approach the, the torso. And I've brought the elbow over, and that's going to adjust pretty much everything I have here. But 
the best tool I have is actually my intuition of what looks natural or what looks off. If something looks off to you, there's something wrong. You're never going to find, oh, it's perfect. I guess I just saw it right. It's, if it looks like there's an issue in part of the drawing every single time. The trick, though, is that often those issues are not in the area you, you think they are. So you think there's something wrong with the arm, but it's really something wrong with the torso. You think there's something wrong with the nose, but it's really something wrong with the cranium because of the relative way in which we uh, perceive things. So, but don't ignore it. If, some, if you think something's wrong, you, you, know, you want to, I mean, unless you run out of time, uh, which is common in figure drawing, you want to figure out what's going on. You want to be a Hercule Poirot when it comes to investigating the the uh, the drawing problems. You're you're like a crack detective. You're not just gonna be like, I don't know, it looks funny. Whatever. Because when you start finding answers to these questions, you you learn something. You also are learning like what your uh, tendencies are. Like what kind of mistakes do you tend to make? Most of the mistakes are pretty universal, but also like there's going to be specific things that, for example, people tend to make the legs too long or too short, and people tend to sort of fall into those camps, or uh, artists will have a problem with having a heavy hand where they're drawing too dark, or sometimes they're just too tentative and they're too light and they afraid to make marks. Dealing with your drawing problems. That becomes a habit. It becomes a second nature. Like you can just start drawing and as problems come up, you're going to fix them. And that builds confidence because you know with enough experience that you can pretty much fix anything. That reduces your, your fear. I think that's one of the hardest things about figure drawing, especially if you, have, if you, you don't have a ton of experience doing it, is that it's a lot of pressure. There's a bunch of people in the room who maybe you think some of them are drawing better than you. There's people there you want to impress. All of this is going on and it's competitive sometimes. It all depends on where you're studying, but there's all these, so this is all psychological stuff. None of those things have anything to do with drawing. So try to really engage with the actual, engage with the work and ignore everything else. It doesn't matter what other people say. Unless it's people at New Masters Academy. But just letting go of that anxiety, I think that's something that would help a lot of artists. And they'll tell themselves things like, I don't think I'm ready for life drawing. I they'll just say a bunch of stuff, but it really comes down to them just wanting to avoid the, uh, avoid that in-person uh, that's sort of stressful situation. Doing that. sort of plan this so that the head ends here or begins here depending on how you think about it man the heels will be there don't confuse the heel with the front of the foot because if there's in perspective or if your eye lines above it the, feet, the toes for example will be closer and then from here to here I'm going to look for a halfway point and then I'm going slightly lower than that that's really common in female so the next thing I want to establish is the angle of the pelvis, which to me looks like that, which is basically what I drew. It's a very uh, common thing you need to establish. Even though the shoulders are upraised, 
I can still look at their angle, or I, I can alternately take an angle across across the chest. So if we go here, it looks like this angle is more in line with this. So it's a subtle thing. It's not a super, it's not a super dramatic one. And then I want to see where the, we have a weight bearing leg on the left, and I want to see where that weight bearing leg sort of is lining up, and it's actually lining up right with the pit of the neck, which is very convenient. I'm, I'm getting the full frontal uh, angle of the aspect on this pose from where I'm seated. The head's there, the pit of the neck is going to be somewhere in this ballpark. It's not a lot of lay-in I did, but it's enough for me to now chase the rhythms a little bit and just be a little more on the mark. From here to here, halfway should be the knee. So I'm going to expect one knee to be here. And then the loose knee, the knee that's not holding the weight, is going to swing out, which is very typical. And I don't know, you know, you see these classical patterns get repeated in nature. And is it like, is it life imitating art? Or is this, or were they just really good at just seeing what the body naturally wants to do? I think it's more of the, more of the latter. Boom, boom, boom. Maybe we're just, maybe even a little lower than that. And so now what I'm going to do... And then the asis is going to be in line with the uh, with the shoulder on this side. So I'm going to find that. And the other asis is pretty much in line with the other shoulder. It's pretty good for her foreheads to get us to the bottom of the torso. So this is actually not the bottom of the torso because the buttocks are a little lower, but we just can't see them. So from here to here, I can split this distance in half. This distance in half, and that should give me the that should give me the height of the head. So I don't make this into a big thing about proportions, but if I've got a little extra time, it can pay off to. Think about it a little more explicitly. So I'm using an egg here and I'm using um, the center line is actually maybe more oriented that way. I'm just getting a sense that it's looking down. And if the pit of the neck is here, because the arms are raised, that's going to do things with the neck. It's going to change things. I know the knee is here. I can find these rhythms of the leg. This moves towards this direction here, towards the ACES. The extra fullness that you see on females that cover the greater trochanter, I think of that as a amplification of the curve. From a gestural perspective, that's how I try to use that. This is going to be straighter, and then it's going to, we're going to feel that full roundness even more. The leg is high on the outside. We're making our way down. We've actually got a rhythm here. Hand slip there, just because I was trying to avoid the microphone. This is a little darker. I didn't mean it to be that dark. If we've got the asis to asis, then you can see we've got a distance here for the side. Here we've got a distance that's a little more, so it's slightly rotated to the right. And so if that's the case, I'm going to expect... Something like this. And 
So now I want to get the rib cage. Like what I've done is almost like parentheses. This is how Glenn teaches it. I, I'm doing the sides and I'm thinking about the top of the rib cage and the rear, looking at the center line across the sternum. How much of the rib cage gets exposed before it seemingly uh, drops into the lower torso. Center line across the abdominal area. And on a female, you don't tend to get a separation beneath the navel as strongly as with a male. So with a male beneath the navel, we have a separation of the right and left side. Female form, not so much. It tends to soften out. Same thing with the back above the sacrum. Placement of those forms, and I'm trying to make sure that it all of it's going to fit in the space I've allocated for it. Sometimes I'll use this kind of shape for external oblique. And this is where a lot of the shifting around of the, the shapes happen because as you start adding these in, you start to realize you have to move things around, like little puzzle pieces to get them to fit. Uh, sartorius and tensor of the fascia lata, at least in a cross section there. Vastus lateralis. I want to see where the the patella and then the fatty bursas that support the patella, like the padding, where that is. If I can see a little bit of the femur here, I want to indicate that. Show this. Insertion of the iliotibial tract without letting things get too wide. So it's it's all that's always the balance. You want the part, you want to show the parts and show and design them the way you want, but you don't want the outer contours or the simple forms to get too disjointed. And and that interplay between those two things is that's a lot of what you're doing uh, when you're drawing. It's, oh, my la is it getting too wide? Is it getting too long? Is it getting too short? And then adjusting it, but then still getting those pieces to work. It's, a, it's incredibly difficult to do. Figure drawing is, the, is really the hardest subject matter you can tackle for a lot of reasons other than those. Part of them are psychological. We're just very sensitive to when something looks wrong with the figure. Whereas if you were drawing penguins or something, nobody would notice because they don't really know what a penguin looks like. And also, like in this kind of pose, you're really going to want to show the difference in the knee. So what does the knee look like when it's bearing a lot of weight? And what does the knee look like when it is more relaxed? So the rhythms are, I'm getting a lot of notation down in the rhythms, but there's some work to do on the proportions in terms of the, the way these different parts are looking.
So it looks like the medial epicondyle is sort of lining up with the, with the eye line on the one arm. And then on the other side, it's actually higher up with the forehead. I'm going to try to slow it down here because anytime the arms are upraised, it's going to be a slightly less familiar pose and so the orientations of things are not exactly where you're used to and so I want to use as much care as I can. This one is lower, so what does that mean? Well, because it it's lower but it's also not out in space as far left to right, that means it must be for shortening. So you, you can see for shortening with, with practice, but you, it, you really, it's also a predictive thing. I'm, I'm looking at where things are and I'm noticing that, oh, that must be foreshortened just because of these distances. And then when you, when you uh, know to look for it, that's when you'll, that's when you'll see it. I got one arm up and I'm going to do the I typically don't draw the breast until pretty late. And the reason why that is is that I'm still moving the rib cage around. So if I'm shifting things around, the last thing I I don't want to put like the breasts are completely dependent on the position of the the skeleton. And so I think it makes sense to lock that stuff in before you uh before you try to do the do the uh, the secondary forms, but at some point you'll need to start placing these secondary forms in order to to see what you're doing. And if you find that you if you find that your hand starts to hurt, it means you're gripping the pencil too tightly and. Sometimes switching up your grip can help with that. And one thing I'm really interested in is in the this S curve in the armpit area. Essentially, I want to get that direction going more because I want to play this against the sort of flat dropping on this side. So that's, I'm giving you the notes of like what this new version I want to accomplish. I want to, I want to get, I want to get this a little wider across here and I want to, I'm going to move the knee to be more on this side and then move this foot to be more on the outside. Just, I'm trying to, basically what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to accentuate the differences between the, the sides to make it feel more uh, dramatic. And... Gonna make the neck a little longer, which I can do in two ways. I can drop the pit of the neck. Or I can lift the top of the head. And then I want to feel more of the, the diagonal here. And I want to relate how the inner knee is different between these two maybe even play those against each other compositionally so what i'm doing here is this i'm allowing these to get close but not touch 
in an intentional way in this case. And then I want to show how this sort of feeling on this thigh and then compare that to more of that. So these are some differences I want to accentuate. I want this to taper more here and I want to think of the waist. I want to think of the uh, the axis of the waist, it's not horizontal. So the thinnest point of the rib cage is doing this and I wanna make sure that my drawing is, it's essentially what I'm talking about is, is contrapposto. And then we got a really nice neck. This time we can see it because the hair is not obscuring it and so I wanna take advantage and draw the neck. What's nice about this is that even though the arms are lifted because the elbows are so far out, it's not smooshing everything up uh, near the head and neck, and so I still have some nice shapes. And then also I want to get this sort of nice serpentine S curve that's going on here and show, like, is it the same exact curve on this side? Or are they different? think they are different. Uh, I know they're different. I'm, I'm just, I don't know why I said it like that. But. And then I want to, um, I'm going to want to feel the difference between the, because there's a slight difference in the foreshortening of the different arms. And I want to make sure that comes across all of this without throwing the proportions out of, out of whack. And so, Okay, so it actually is closer to this edge than that edge. It also is aligning with the, uh, the wide point of the hips. And so one side is going to be higher than the other. It's just a little more of a clear design choice, I think. I like on the female figure um, how the thoracic arch is often like, it's subtle, and so you have to like look for evidence of it. But it also tends to have these nice shapes that I think on the male it can get a little bit, uh, if you're not careful with the male, it can feel a little, a little grotesque, a little like, too skeletal or too irregular or whatever, but I, I, li I like the thoracic arch when it's just like a little, little evidence of it, and you have to know it's there to, to properly draw it. That I find that to be a fun a challenge. Okay, so how do I get this angle stronger? Well, I just think about it, and I just I think about that. Where is the apex of that curve? And I can relate the apex of the curve to the bottom of the pubic area here. So I can, I can actually come up with an angle, and that's the angle. I'm going to do that again, because I want to get this stuff right, because this, this is basically where the, that's, that's happening by the way, because the microphone is, I have a microphone right in front of my face, so I can't move my arm in front of it. This axis is important, so I want to make sure that this is the apex of that curve. And this is where these overlaps are happening. Specifically this one, and then this one. And there's a relationship between this curve and there's an alignment with the uh, external oblique that I'm seeing that I like it because it gives me a uh, gives me an alignment to play off of. So now I'm literally drawing the 
ASIS, and ASIS means anterior superior iliac spine. That's what ASIS stands for, ASIS. It's really a, a challenge to try to get the feeling of roundness and straightness to get those to work together. And there's also sort of an angle that's getting created, this sort of tapering angle, and then it's almost a little bit of a flattening out transition and then we're stepping out and then the um, asis is what is causing this so this becomes a side and this becomes a side and I want to catch this down here so I'm, I'm, this is a fullness that is resting on that the more muscular form There's a little bit of reinterpretation necessary here. I need to get the heel here because otherwise it'll feel. Not correct. Just put in a few more parts there to make sure that I'm thinking of this area, uh, that I'm not creating a balance problem. Feet are really important to get right because if they look wrong, then the whole pose feels off balance, which could be what you want. Let's say you're doing like floating figures or something like cool like that, but usually you want to be able to control that feeling of balance. And it's something that has to be sort of deliberately, uh, deliberately studied. And what I what I don't want is I don't want all those beautiful rhythmical curves that I'm using to design the forms. I don't want those again to become so dominant that you. I don't want to turn the figure into spaghetti. I want it to feel solid, like like it's made of flesh and bone. I'm sneaking in all that beautiful design. I'm, I'm, it's an illusion. You know, I'm trying to design something that is abstract and that is artistically interesting, but I also want you to not be so directly aware of it. I want you to think of it as more of a, a natural thing. That's sort of, the, fu that's sort of the, the, the fun of it. I think I'm going to, I want to just sort of take it in more of a gestural rhythmical direction here in terms of alternating rhythms, usually clockwise and counterclockwise. I want to, I want to feel those. So I'm sort of switching gears here for a minute and now I'm going to sort of re-entering. I'm going to re-enter that, uh, this problem and this time I'm going to. Just think about this, how I want these flows to be. And already, I'm sort of correcting some of these angles. Yeah, I think that's what it is. I, I think the calves need to be leaner. The ankles need to be a little more precisely placed, and then I need to I need to hit those ankles harder with the movement of the pose. Uh, 
I want to show this the strength of the vastus lateralis more. I think I was making making her too soft, and I'm not acknowledging the uh, muscular areas enough. And sometimes it's just that it's just this. Oftentimes it's like that. It's just this balance. It's the right amount of subtlety versus boldness. It's the right amount, whatever that. And so you often go back and forth. You know, you make it rounder, you make it more angular. do this when I switch gears and I rediscover the rhythms, if I rediscover, and it could be the, the pose is, is changed. It could be what I saw. I had some error there at first that I didn't notice. And now, now it's clear to me, but for whatever reason, I find that when I go back to the gestural stage, even if it seems like, Oh no, I made a mistake. I'm erasing. It always, I always end up with something better. That doesn't mean though that you don't lose some of the work that you put in. And so you, if you, you need to, you need to think about that, like getting that stuff back into it. A lot of these problems I was talking about are sort of getting resolved. And so now I want to look at sort of the interior. Make sure that these forms are properly placed. Getting this sort of heart shape under the navel, which is the classical feminine form. Males have it too, but it tends to be a little shorter on the male and, and higher. On female, it tends to be a little wider because the pelvis is wider. I've got sort of a better base, and you saw how I sort of worked to get it. And so we've got 15 minutes left. That's I know that's not enough for me to to do a finished drawing so I can decide, I can work on these arms, I can do a portrait, I can work on the face, which might be nice, or I can also sort of zoom in on an area and work on that. So I'm gonna sharpen my pencil and then think about that. Now, so I like the challenge of this sort of frontal subtle pose because um, when you have a frontal pose, all of, the, all of the issues with symmetry are very obvious. Anybody can sort of pick up on them. And so you have to be uh, conscious about that. And I'm just sort of finessing some of these overlaps get, get rid of some of these diagrammatical lines I was drawing for your benefit because they're so they don't distract me okay so now I can get a little more involved in the interior forms I may have lifted these a bit much because I I sort of liked the I think I unintentionally was exaggerating how lifted her uh, her upper abdominals are because I like the shapes. But now that I'm seeing them more carefully, I'm realizing that I need to I need to stretch this stuff out a little more. I need to lower this stuff. So I need to essentially what that means I need to redraw it, which is all good. But I want to make sure to get the same nice, uh, beautiful shapes that I had before. I don't want to draw an inferior version of that.
okay, here's what I'm like. I'm starting to get to what I really like about the female rib cage. And what I like is that at first, uh, because it's smaller or narrower and it's, it's not as obvious, we don't have these big bony protrusions, you start to think that there's just not much evidence there. And then as you look more carefully, you start to see like there's so much information available. And it was always there, you just weren't, you haven't quieted yourself enough to notice it. I don't mean this like a kung fu movie or something. We're like, you must quiet yourself to hear the storm. I'm, what I mean is uh, there's different levels of attention and pace and you need to understand the, the advantages and disadvantages of them so that you can manipulate it and organize it in such a way that you get a, uh, a good result. So, you know, I know on the first draft that there's going to be these inaccuracies and I'm, I'm counting on it. That doesn't mean I'm not trying to be more accurate. That's different. I'm not saying like we don't, we don't, uh, we don't try to compensate for it. You're always trying to be more accurate because look, if you can get it really close on your first draft, that's just making everything cleaner and, and better. It's not like you want it to, you're not, accepting defeat there but what 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 it really is more about is starting to become more aware of your of your uh, of your own psychology and those limitations and until you're aware of it until these unconscious things become conscious it's hard to fix them or improve them or or understand them in a in a more meaningful way I try to look at my work as if it's not my work. I try to look at it like it's, I try to see it more objectively, which is hard. It's because you just drew it. This is, <laughs> you just did it. I'm wanting to kind of get into the, uh, the core shadow a little bit just like a little notation I'm not drawing a core shadow I'm sort of drawing where a core shadow will be there's so much you can do with like the rendering stage and with cross hatching and tones and so much magic that can come into play, but also like it's really important like when not to separate a form. So yeah, I'm just talking about the roundness of the sort of apple heart shaped sort of form beneath the navel. And if you notice the well, you don't notice, you can't see, I'll tell you. Ex the connection between that and the external blink is not the external oblique is not always obvious at all. And so even though you know that these are sort of separate segments, at least that's either treated a in art history is they're always, they're rarely grouped uh, together. But if that, like if I have a core shot on one side, I can show the separation on one side and then I don't need to show it on the other. So I can sort of play the, I can play with using symmetry. I can connect some forms and separate them on either side. And that can give me a, a more, I kind of have a more interesting situation because I'm getting the best of both worlds. I'm getting to show you how well I can design it when, I mean, presumably, how well I can design it when it's unified, and I can show you how well I can design it when it's separate. And that always makes me think of Piero della Francesca, who was a Renaissance artist that I've studied quite a bit, particularly for his work in, with perspective and the body. But compositionally, and you can, you can learn about this in, on New Masters Academy, but compositionally, uh, he's really good at playing differences against one another and I really like that and so I try to find that so I use symmetry in terms of trying to become more um, accurate and trying to design better figures but I also use symmetry as a an opportunity to draw the eyes differently 
but then but then it's still looking correct. And, and that's a playfulness that you see in a lot of the old masters is the uh, playing with symmetry. You know, not just like these parts should be the same size, but because the pose is dynamic, these are also different. And how can you accentuate those differences? Just like the contrapposto, we've been talking about the different tilts of the different parts and the different rotations. It's a little bit like that, but you can play with that concept basically everywhere. And I'm also... We've got a cast shadow here. You don't have to draw the cast shadows. You don't have to be so literal with these things. You can omit them. But if the cast shadow is helping you and it's what you want, uh, keep it. And then how the cast shadow unifies with these half tones that are becoming a core shadow. This is a design opportunity. This is like two warring armies meeting. What's going to happen? The cast shadow, the, the, the clan of the cast shadow is meeting the half tone nation. What's going to happen? That's literally the kind of stuff I'm thinking. <laughs> I'm trying to say I'm on, I'm trying to say I'm on mushrooms. <laughs> All right, this is supposed to be inspiring. Everyone's laughing. I don't I don't think these people know who I am. Everybody everybody watching, I don't think they know who I am. And Steve Houston's really great at describing that, but you know, it, it's those are the stories that we play out. We play out these stories in form and in value and in shape and in line. And if you have nothing to say, we can tell. If you're not thinking much, it'll show. And so, we can tell how much of yourself you're putting into your work. That's my point. As I start, you know, as I start to separate her rib cage and stuff, she starts to like age, and I'm starting to notice. Okay, this maybe looks like. I want those separations because I like those, but then, if it's too much and it's it's like aging her, or changing her too much, how do you balance those differences? A big part of that is just value. It's just value. It's like you can do what you want to do, in the design. But then also make sure that you're not making that too dark. And so by controlling your value more, you're able to get away with, you're get, able to get away with more sort of uh, people like Ilya Mrochnik and Leo. Mancini Resco and a lot of the academic artists that uh, I know, um, there's, they do value so beautifully. And even though that's not the uh, approach I'm using, their control of the value and their ability to create impressionistic sense of, of light is really valuable because if you, even if you're drawing directly, just by controlling some of those tones, you can... Uh, you can achieve a more compelling effect that way. Not that we have time to do anything of the sort. I mean, I don't have tens of hours here. I've got a very short amount of time here. I've got a few more minutes, really. It also comes down to, like, what notations, what notations are useful here. And so I haven't actually drawn the clavicles yet. Well, I think I drew it on the first layer, but... In this case, what I like about it, I, I, in this case, I'm not going to draw the clavicle so obviously. I'm just going to play with these, play with how these planes are, are, are turning. And by, in doing that, I'm realizing this needs to move over. I'm going to show the, I'm going to show... Dude, when I get focused, I sound like my grandmother. I'm using like Dust Bowl era language. I was hearing it before. But I'm going to uh, separate the lateral and the long head of uh, triceps brachia. Yeah. And 
when you've got a solid base and then you're having fun sort of just exploring the different forms, that's really the real payoff. It's like I've been a very good boy and I got all my proportions in and now I can play. Now I can pretend I'm Sun Tzu and have warring clans. And now like I, I'm aware of the time limitation. I'm just trying to like get some more notations and like, oh, don't forget this, don't forget that, don't forget this is so straight before it gets overlapped and don't forget how high that uh, lateralis is peaking. And don't forget that this steps down into the patella and make sure you have the patella the right, and that's time. That's what, that's what figure drawing's like, so. <laughs> also is drooping. But thank you for joining me.